Gather round Souls fans and let's learn the basics of one of the most innovative and challenging game series of the last decade. I'm Jeremy, aka Junglist, Australian games critic and huge Dark Souls fan. And I'm Michael, otherwise known on YouTube for my Dark Souls videos as Vati Vidya. The Souls series tests the resolve of those who play it, and perhaps you're here because you feel unequipped. Rest assured that after watching this short video series, you'll have everything you need to tackle Dark Souls 2. And that's whether you're a new player or a veteran looking to see what's changed. We've chopped these videos up into little bits so you can just tackle the bit that you want to know more about, so see the description below. If you're new to Dark Souls, you'll want to watch these videos. If you're a veteran and you've been there, done that, we have a section towards the end specifically about what's new in Dark Souls 2. Shall we get started? Absolutely. Dark Souls 2 is probably unlike any other game you've played. It has a shallow underlying story for the casual player, but if you look just a bit deeper, you'll realize that there's a depth to the lore and the story in these games, which is absolutely staggering. You will lose everything. By gathering item descriptions and talking to NPCs in the game world, eventually you'll piece together this story that is partly your own. There's no proper way to experience the story in Dark Souls 2, and that's part of the wonder of it. But to get to that point, guys, you're going to have to master their combat, and that's where we come in. Oh, I'll fool you no longer. You lose your souls. All of them. Over and over again. <laughs> Let's start out with what's on your screen. Right here is your health bar. When you start Dark Souls 2, your ability to heal is limited, so every little bit counts. Whenever you take damage from enemy attacks, environmental traps, or obstacles, this bar depletes. If it reaches zero, then you die. Right below it is the stamina bar. Doing attacks, blocking, or rolling all takes stamina. Stamina regenerates quickly, however it regenerates slower whenever your shield is raised. You want to practice being aware of these bars at all times because they'll affect your playstyle. Low on health? Don't panic, but it's time to back off and find an opportunity to heal, if you're in a situation you can back off from. Low on stamina? Drop your shield so you can regenerate, because without it you won't be able to block and you won't be able to fight. Down in the bottom left you've got your right hand weapon and left hand weapons. You can have three of each accessible at any one time. Above is your magic spells that you have with you, and below are your items. You can cycle between your weapons, shields, spells, and items by pushing in the corresponding direction on your D-pad. Lastly, in the bottom right is the amount of souls you have. These are gained by killing enemies and exploring. You can either spend them as currency or use them to become more powerful and level up. We recommend you don't carry around too many souls with you, since you run the risk of losing them all if you die. The class you start as in Dark Souls 2 is absolutely no guarantee of where you'll end up. The warrior may become the holy cleric, or the sorcerer may forsake his books and become the knight. Remember, all your starting class does is give you a small boost to the stats you'll need for that playstyle. But before we get to stats, we'll need to explain where you level up and how you actually do it. Back in Majula, you'll find the first bonfire. Right near it will be a woman named the Emerald Herald, who you should have a chat with. Are you the next monarch? Or merely a pawn of fate, bearer of the curse? She provides you with your first Estus Flask, your most treasured healing item. She also offers you the ability to level up your character, should you have the souls to do so. Take this with you. May it ease your journey. Now let's talk more about you. The character stats in Dark Souls 2 can be a lot to get your head around, so we'll go through them one by one. On the left are your nine stats you can level up. Each time you spend souls to level up a stat, your character level increases by one, and the amount of souls you need for the next level increases as well. On the right are the attributes that increase as you level up your character, shown in blue. This should give you an idea of what leveling up each stat does. 
As you increase your stats, your weapons that scale with stats will do more damage. Different stats will also level up your resistances to various magics and various status effects like bleed or poison damage. Different armors and shields also carry with them their own resistances to these elements. And on the other side of that coin, certain enemies are weak to specific elements. For example, fleshy enemies are vulnerable to bleed damage, and heavily armored foes don't have a good time with electricity. If you need help on this screen, then press select for a description, but let's go over the stats now. Vigor relates to your health. Upgrade that and your health bar will increase. Endurance is the same thing for your stamina bar. And vitality relates to how much equipment you can carry. The less equipment you have on you, the faster you'll move and roll. And the less stamina will be used in combat. Edging towards your maximum weight will make you roll like this. The attunement stat governs how many spells you can bring into battle, but also the speed at which they're cast. Every build that uses spells should invest in this stat. Strength is fairly straightforward. Some weapons will become more powerful the higher your strength stat is, and these weapons are really good at breaking enemy defenses through sheer force. And dexterity is similar. Certain weapons will scale up in the damage they do along with your dexterity, and these are usually finesse weapons like bows or rapiers. Adaptability is a new stat that increases your survivability across situations. You'll become more agile in almost every movement you make, and you'll increase your ability to resist toxins and dangerous elements in the world. Do not underestimate this stat. Down the bottom, intelligence increases the power of your sorceries and fire magic, and similarly, faith increases the power of your miracles, lightning, fire magic, and dark magic. There's one other attribute we want to talk about today, and that's poise. Poise essentially makes it so there's less of a chance you'll be interrupted by an enemy attack. Different pieces of armor will contribute a different poise rating, and essentially the higher this is, the less the chance you'll be interrupted while performing your own attack. The heavier your armor, the more poise it will give, but the slower your character will be. So you're going to have to experiment, try on different armors, and see if you prefer the heavy character who tanks hits, or the lighter character, who can't afford to get hit. All weapons, most spells, and some armors have stat requirements that must be met before they can be wielded properly. For example, here we have a greatsword, which requires 28 strength and 10 dexterity. That's compared with this short sword that requires 14 strength and 6 dexterity. In the case of weapons, two-handing effectively halves the stat requirements. So that great sword is available to us even if we only have 14 strength. On this note, bear in mind that Souls games treat stats as more of a means to an end. Try and get the stats you need for the gear you want, and after that, don't worry too much more about it. It's important to level up your avatar in Dark Souls 2, but it's more important to level up yourself. As you venture through the land of Drang Lake, the souls you collect from destroying enemies can be used to trade for other items, or to imbue yourself with more power. Should you die, and trust me, you're going to die, you will come back in a hollow state. Dying again will further this process along until you become completely hollow. Such is your curse. But at the point at which you died, you will leave a green bloodstain, in which the souls you had on you are kept. Reach this bloodstain and touch it, and you'll regain your souls. Fail to reach it and die again, and they're lost forever. If that frightens you, then you ought to just give up right now. Like I have. <laughs> the bonfires that pepper the land are your beacons of hope. Once you light them, the bonfire acts as a checkpoint and is where you will respawn upon death. The bonfires are linked to each other, allowing you to travel between them at will. But be warned, resting at a bonfire will also rest the world around you. Your health and potions will be replenished, but all enemies will return. In Dark Souls 2, we see what permanent changes we can make to the world before it's time to sit by the fire. Continually dying will make your character more and more hollow, and you'll notice your character's flesh wearing away. More importantly though, your maximum health will edge lower and lower every time you die, eventually stopping at 50%. For when the undead dies, it is never truly dead, but only one step closer to hollowing. Not all undead are hollows, 
but all hollows were once undead. But don't worry, there's one way to reduce this process, by consuming the human effigies you find throughout the land. They're rare, so use them wisely. These restore your maximum health, but more importantly, they restore your humanity. Be careful out there. There's talk of unsavory bandits who prey upon travelers like yourself. So let's talk combat. For newcomers to the game, it's important to realize that this is not God of War. This isn't a button-mashing combat system. You don't swing first and ask questions later. Far better to take a reactionary approach to combat. Watch your enemies first and get to know their attack patterns before you commit. Mastering combat is a must in this world. So if you need a refresher, you can always check the in-game tutorial. But we'll start here with what the buttons do. Think of the triggers as your hands. Whatever you've got in your right hand will be used by R1 and R2. And the same goes for the left. Mostly people have a weapon in their right hand. For this, R1 is attack and R2 is strong attack. If you've got a shield in your left hand, L1 is to block and L2 is to parry. Now the face buttons. We'll talk about both PS3 and 360 controllers. If you want to carry a weapon in both hands, press triangle or Y. This will enable you to do more damage with the weapon. However, attacks will take more stamina and take longer. If you want to carry two of the same weapon, you get a special benefit. Hold down the triangle button while holding both of these weapons, and you'll enter a special stance that allows you to attack with both at once. To perform many actions in the world, like opening doors or resting at bonfires, press X for PS3 or A for 360. Using an item is square or X, these are things like swigging your restus or applying weapon buffs. Down on the D-pad changes which item is selected, right changes what's in your right hand, left changes what's in your left hand, and up changes which magic spell you have selected. We've deliberately left one button for last, and that's your roll button. This is circle or B, and you'll find it very important to roll in Dark Souls 2. There's a small window during your roll when you're invincible to most attacks, which means if you time it right, you can use it to evade almost anything. Holding down the roll button will make you sprint, and while sprinting you can jump by pressing down on the left thumbstick. It's the only jump button in the game, use it to get to tough areas. If you press R1 while sprinting, you'll also do a sprint attack. Lastly, by pressing the roll button while standing, you'll perform a backwards hop useful for avoiding quick attacks. Pressing down on the right thumbstick will lock onto enemies, useful for making sure your swings aim true. Note that now your movement is relative to his position. This allows you to strafe in a circle around your enemies. If you find yourself behind one, a press of R1 will do a backstab maneuver for more damage. Press R3 again to turn off the lock, for example when you need to run away. You can also change the enemy you are locked onto by flicking the right stick to cycle between enemies. You also have a guard break attack available to you, which is great against shield-happy enemies, and this is accomplished with a quick flick forward on the left stick and R1. Every part of combat revolves around the weapon you use, and that's because weapons differ in more than just stats. Different weapons have different movesets, and different classes of weapon have different styles. The most effective builds are those built around the weapon you use. In Dark Souls 2, there is something called weapon scaling, where weapons become stronger depending on your stats. For example, some weapons become much stronger the higher your dexterity is, and this degree of scaling is visible here. From best to worst, degree of scaling is S, A, B, C, D, E. You should check this on every weapon you use, because some weapons may become more powerful with scaling. If you want to compare weapons, equip one and look at alternatives in your inventory. Ones with higher damage output will have a blue value here, and ones with lower damage output will show a different value in red. But remember, weapons are more than just the damages they do. It's about their range, their moveset, their speed. Find a weapon that suits you. Swords are good all-rounders, with some thrusting and some slashing attacks. Most of the time, both strength and dexterity increase the damage effects of swords equally. As you can see here, this sword has a C scaling in both strength and dexterity. Axes and maces are more strength based, and after successive attacks, are better at wearing down your opponent's guard. This triggers a state of weakness which you can capitalize on by tapping R1 right in front of them. Again, the strength scaling of these weapons are seen here. 
Other weapons like bows, rapiers and scimitars require a bit more finesse and the damage you do with these will scale as you increase your dexterity level. The wide horizontal sweeps of the great weapons are perfect for taking on multiple enemies at once. As you can probably tell, these weapons require a huge investment in strength to wield properly. But in the more claustrophobic altercations, you'd be better off with a thrusting weapon, like a rapier or a spear. These thrusting weapons can also be used while holding up your shield. There are also magical or blessed weapons which scale up with intelligence or faith respectively. These supplement the abilities of the sorcerer or the cleric, giving them a viable melee option. You'll also notice that weapons use different amounts of stamina, and each has their own animation and time for attacks and recovery periods. It's important to understand how long your attacks take to execute and recover, because during this time you can't block and you're vulnerable. There's so much to tell you, but the most important thing we can say is to be observant. Enemies have their own move sets and styles. If you're observant, you can take note of enemy attack patterns, learn the best method for beating them, even if it's through trial and error. For example, this enemy will always attack you after you hit him with his shield up. Get behind him and backstab him, or break him down with a guard break attack. Try learning how to bait enemies into attacking you, so you can either block or avoid their attacks, and then retaliate with your own. Watch the duration of their attacks and look for openings, and make sure you can recover in time to be able to block, roll, or evade him again. Do you see what I mean? You should be keeping a little enemy journal in your head so you know how to deal with them in the future. In general though, enemies are vulnerable to attack after they've finished attacking. Many hollow enemies are especially vulnerable after they've finished a flurry of attacks. So block or dodge, then counterattack with your own. Some weapons can also inflict unique status ailments, and the land of Dranglaic is full of enemies that will try to take you out using these more subtle means. If you see one of these bars building up while being attacked, you should probably panic a little. Some enemies have weapons specifically designed to make you bleed, and in that situation, if the bar fills, you'll lose a massive amount of health straight away, and have limited stamina. Another ailment is poison, which can be inflicted in a variety of ways. If the poison bar reaches full, you'll slowly lose health over a period of time, until the poison finishes or is cured. One can also be cursed in Drang Lake, and cursed items will damage your maximum health as long as you're near them, or until you destroy them. Lastly, and most dangerously, is the Petrify Meter. If this bar reaches full, you'll be frozen as a statue, shown in other players' worlds as a stationary reminder not to be cursed. Certain gear will better be able to resist poisoning, cursing, bleeding and petrification, or you can try to avoid it through sheer skill in combat. Dark Souls is harsh, but fair. You start the game confused and weak because it won't conform to your idea of what a video game is, but by overcoming adversity and using persistence, you can master combat in Dark Souls 2. You can't survive Dranglaic without mastering at least the basics of melee combat. But should you choose, your true power can come from the various forms of sorceries, miracles, and pyromancy. For magic users, spell castings are limited and replenish at the bonfire, unless you find a consumable item to replenish your spell uses. As you raise your attunement stat, you'll be able to cast more spells. But let's get into the difference between sorcerers and clerics. A sorcerer's power comes from intelligence and mainly deals with either magical energy or fire. You need catalysts to cast these spells, such as a staff, and these are held in your hand and used like a weapon, with R1 to cast. Pyromancers require a pyromancy hand to cast their fiery incantations. Clerics are the holier magic users, and their power comes from faith. Their miracles deal in holy energy and lightning, and are also associated with dark hex magic. Instead of catalysts, miracles are cast with a blessed item such as a chime. You can increase your damage and magic by upgrading your staff, chime, or pyromancy hand, just like you would with a melee weapon. Sometimes you'll buy spells from merchants, sometimes you'll find them around the world of Dranglaic. Miracles began as tales told by gods. We preserve their will with lore, pray to their greatness, and are blessed in return. And now, you can have this power for yourself. But all magic users need to level the attunement stat, which governs how many spells you can bring into battle. It's up to you to decide how much you'll need, but raising your attunement stat also raises the speed at which you cast spells. 
and you can bet the fiends of Dranglaic won't let you take your time. Not all problems in Dranglaic can be solved by a sword or board. In fact, you'll have to rely on the various items to cover your weaknesses, and the most important of these is Estus. You begin the game with one charge of this item, but as you adventure through the world, you find Estus shards, which you can take to the Emerald Herald to increase the capacity of your flask. Is that a shard? You... Here, let me see it. To see light, however faint it might be. Burning sublime bone dust in the Medulla bonfire will make your Estus flask more effective. Life gems are another healing item you'll find around the world. These are more finite and they only heal over time, but they do let you walk while using them. Thrown items can be very handy, such as knives, fire bombs, and witching urns, which do magical damage. These items can be locked onto enemies with R3 to make sure they hit. Through constant use, your held equipment will also degrade, and you can see the status of your equipment in its own little health bar right next to it. This is replenished when you rest at a bonfire, but because some pieces of equipment are hardier than others, you might need to make use of repair powder sold at the blacksmith. By rubbing resins on your weapon, you can imbue it with additional power. Pine resin, for example, will add lightning damage. Similarly, you can increase your resistance to these elements with burrs. An orange burr, for example, will increase fire resistance. These are items you'll either find through exploration or through combat. Light and illumination play a huge role in Dark Souls 2, and this is made possible by a new item, you might recognize it, called the torch. Torches can be found throughout the game world. They will burn for five minutes once lit, illuminating the darkness around your character and aiding with navigation in ill-lit areas. In many of these areas, you will find unlit braziers, which you can light to provide a permanent light source for future run-throughs, making an area easier to navigate. But be warned, if you hold a torch in one hand, that means you're essentially sacrificing use of your shield. It's a toss-up between visibility and going without protection. How badly do you fear the dark? And of course, you won't want to neglect rings in Dark Souls 2. Dark Souls 2 gives the player the ability to wear four rings at one time. Rings offer the ability to cover your weaknesses, for example, increasing HP, increasing your burden, increasing physical or elemental defense, or perhaps even the amount of damage you take from falling. Rings are a great way to balance out your character without even having to level up. The key here again is experimentation. As soon as you find a ring, try it on and see how it affects your play. There are over 50 rings in Dark Souls 2, and since there's only four ring slots, this means you're going to need to choose what you wear and possibly when you wear it to face the many challenges in the game. From time to time, as you seek misery, your world will blend with others. The timelines and spaces of Drang Lake are such that the journeys of others will bleed into yours, even if you're not of the same land or time. This can be both beneficial and dangerous. You'll come across orange soapstones in your travels, which allow you to write messages to others. These messages will permeate between worlds and can be used to help or hinder fellow adventurers. You can rate messages you find up or down. You'll also see illusions of other travelers from time to time. This will happen mostly around bonfires where weary travelers rest and where you stand, others might see. If you come across one of their bloodstains, you can touch it to witness the last 10 seconds before they die and perhaps avoid the same traps they fell into. White sign soapstones forge an even stronger connection between worlds. By writing your sign, someone can summon you into their world to engage in jolly cooperation. You can do the same thing. If you're in human form, having used an effigy and not died since doing so, you can summon white phantoms to assist you in boss battles. Some of these are human and some of them are NPCs you need to have met during the game, who will often leave their summon signs shortly before a boss. There are also those who will invade your world without wanting to help you. You see these as red phantoms on screen, and that means it's time for player versus player combat. Defeating a player in this way will get you a reward in the form of souls. You'll be warned on screen when an invader interrupts your exploration of the world. Drang Laic is an open world, and though some paths are easier than others, you should explore it in any way you wish. 
Navigation in a Souls game is a really important thing. Most levels loop back on around themselves, providing shortcuts halfway through that allow you to bypass difficult parts of the level. Shortcuts usually consist of a physical change to the world, like unlocking a gate or blowing up a wall. These are permanent changes to the world. They act as the equivalent of reaching a small ledge you can rest on when climbing a mountain, allowing you to skip obstacles already traversed. If you're clever, sometimes you might even find shortcuts that drastically reduce the time it takes to get to a boss. Sometimes the boss will even come to you. These powerful, tortured souls are not like the bosses in most games. They each have something special about them, whether that means taking advantage of multiplayer or seeking you out before you reach your full power. If you're going to beat those tougher enemies, you're going to need some advanced combat skills. And one of the best to know is parrying. Keep in mind a successful parry just knocks them back. You need to take a step forward and hit R1 to perform the coup de grace. If you're holding a shield that isn't a great shield, you can parry an enemy right before their attack hits you. This will trigger a vulnerable state in which you can press a normal R1 attack to run them through for high damage. One of the most important things to know is that parrying has a bit of a wind-up. There's just a little bit of time when you're moving your shield into position. So you actually need to press the parry button a little bit before the enemy attack is about to hit you. The amount of time this takes can be reduced by raising your adaptability stat. And it pays to focus on enemy animation cues. Usually there will be a type of tell before an enemy attack, either the way they move or a sound they make. If you expect the wrong attack, you could be baited into doing a roll or parry too early. So you might want to remember specific things about them that tell you which attack is to come. Your weapons and armor can be upgraded with various materials you'll find throughout your journey. You can make your armor take more damage and you can make your weapons do more damage. If you like the move set and feel or look of a weapon, or maybe the weight and look of your armor, perhaps you'll choose to upgrade those rather than replace it. You'll need a blacksmith to do so, and one can be found right at the start of your journey, although you'll need to buy a key off a local trader to get into his house. To upgrade your weapon at the blacksmith, you'll need souls and a metal called titanite. A shard of titanite will upgrade most basic equipment. After that, you'll need large titanite shards. It gets bigger from there. Beyond this, there is even the option to imbue weapons with the powers of fire, magic, lightning, and darkness. To do this, you'll need to find special corresponding stones and take them to a blacksmith. As you take out some of the more powerful bosses and collect their souls, these too can be used in the crafting process. With the right stone, you can infuse your weapon or shield with different powers, after which it's upgraded normally. You can infuse weapons with the power of magic, fire, lightning, or dark, in which case the weapon becomes more sensitive to your relative stats. You can give it poison damage or bleed damage. You can make the weapon raw, which means it does more raw damage but pays less attention to your stats. Enchanting it will make it do no magic damage but scale with your intelligence. You can also make it more mundane, or revert it back to its original state. If you infuse shields with these elements, instead of increasing damage, it'll increase their resistances. Believe us when we say things will only get tougher, so make sure you're up to the task and don't neglect the crafting process. Throughout Dark Souls 2, you may come across NPCs who ask you if you wish to join their covenant. These are factions or groups that you can align yourself with, and they carry with them unique effects. You give something to gain something. That's the way humans like it, right? It might be just the thing you need. Some covenants have rules the NPC will explain to you when you join. Most covenants reward you for giving their leader certain types of items or require you to defend their area. Some even involve different types of online matchmaking or PvP combat. Look around Majula and the corresponding areas to see what covenants you can join. Make sure you take part in their requested activities to see what you can achieve. If you need help, why not proclaim faith in the Blue Sentinels? When you face danger, 
the blue sentinels will come to your aid. If you've been watching this tutorial series so far, you'd know we've covered everything from magic to crafting to combat, but this section at the end is purely for people who know Souls games and for people who want to know what's different in Dark Souls 2. And there are some pretty big changes. From Software loves to experiment with new ideas. For starters, one NPC will level you up now, similar to the Maiden in Black from Demon's Souls. You can find this NPC in the starting area of Majula, close to the bonfire. Speaking of bonfires, you'll be able to warp between bonfires now, right from the start. No Lord Vessel necessary. And you'll need the extra help. Avoiding your human form no longer protects you from those wanting to invade your world, though some of the Covenants might help and dying now slowly decreases your maximum hit points down to a minimum of 50%. You can reverse this by using a human effigy, which reverses your hollowing. These are rarer than humanity though, so use them carefully. Dark Souls 2 will allow far more diverse playstyles, whereas before, entire categories of weapons were useless, like axes or whips, you'll find a lot is viable in Dark Souls 2. Everything's here for a reason. Build a character around bows and arrows if you want, which can now be used while moving in combat. You can now effectively dual-wield weapons. Shields can be two-handed for extra damage mitigation. And if you desire, you can even carry a sword and shield left-handed. The adaptability stat is an important new addition. Parrying will now knock your opponent to the ground, making them vulnerable. But you can do multiple parries in succession. When fighting multiple enemies, the choice is yours whether or not to follow through with your post. It's worth noting that now, lightning magic is associated with faith, and fire magic is associated with faith, also with intelligence. Certain enemies in Dranglaic will be able to petrify you. If this meter builds up, that's an instant death. Now that we've explained much about the world of Dark Souls 2, we'll offer you some tips to help you get through it. Don't worry, we won't spoil anything. Dark Souls is very much about exploration and learning how to overcome the enemies and traps, but we'll just help you improve your skills so it all won't seem so hard. So here we go, starting with combat. Number one, learn how to bait enemy attacks. Moving into striking range of enemies and quickly moving back, or striking enemy shields when they're raised, will often cause them to launch into a combo of strikes. This is called baiting. Once the enemy finishes their attack move set, they will be open to attack as they recover. Even better, you can learn to roll through one of their combos and be able to go for the backstab or heavy R2 attack for maximum damage. Remember, nearly all enemy attacks can be rolled through, but this is only if you get the timing right. However, be aware that rolling consumes stamina, so be sure to focus on evasive movement as well, as this uses no stamina at all. Baiting is one of the most important parts of combat. It allows you to become familiar with an enemy's moveset, and it also helps you practice moving your character around, often through groups of multiple enemies, all without being hit. Number two, try to separate enemies in combat. You're always better off fighting enemies one-on-one. -on -one. If you see two enemies in the distance, then move towards one first and try to take one out before the other. To aid in this, you can use items like knives or the bow and arrow, or bolts and crossbows to hit the first target, which will draw him towards you so you can finish him off alone. Knives are excellent for this type of combat. For long distances, use the bow and arrow. For instances where multiple enemies are unavoidable, use your skill and maneuver them into tight corridors or doorways where they can only attack you one at a time. You can also bait the closest enemy and quickly attack them before the other enemies can get into range. Remember not to be greedy. As you swing your weapon, the enemy is recovering. Number three, most enemies function on a distance-based awareness system for aggression. This means you can inch forward towards one enemy, possibly not alerting others nearby to your presence. As soon as enemies become aware of you, they will usually come to you to attack, unless you use ranged weapons like bows or arrows or sorcery. You can then dispatch them far easier in a one-on-one -on -one fashion. Number four, have your shield up only when necessary. Holding your shield up slows stamina recovery. All melee combat and sorcery uses stamina, so you need as much of it in combat as possible. In learning the animations of attacks of your enemies, you should become familiar with the fact that you only need to block exactly when you're being hit. During combat, I'll just usually tap L1 to raise my shield in the very small window of when I can be hit, which means my stamina is always recovering as fast as it can. This makes a huge difference in combat with multiple enemies or against bosses who constantly attack. 
Number 5. Experiment with damage potential and reduction of both weapons and armor. All weapons have set stats for how much damage they do, and you can check these when browsing for weapons at the blacksmith or any other dealer by checking them in your menu when you find one in the world. Find a balance between the weapon with the most damage potential and the one with the moveset you favor most. Personally, I can't go past the battle axe at the start of the game. It has a great moveset for R1 attacks and R2 heavy attack, a short recovery time between attacks, and can be upgraded to do good levels of damage. You might like lighter weapons, or maybe weapons with a bit more reach, or maybe weapons that favor a dexterity build. However, it's important to check all equipment available to you and see what suits you best. Okay, now we can move on to your character. Number one, of high importance to anyone new to Dark Souls is leveling up whenever possible. While you have to warp back to Majula, leveling means that your character can do more damage and take less damage. There's no avoiding the fact that you are going to get hit a lot and die in this game, but leveling your character up will help you do this a lot less. If you want to use specific weapons, be aware of their stat requirements and level up accordingly. There's no real shame in starting another game as well, having realized that you spent your souls the wrong way, or bought the wrong weapons, or even killed the wrong NPC. There's also an item you'll get early on called the Soul Vessel, which allows you to reallocate your stats. Try to keep your equipment load below 60%. Your equipment load is the weight of your equipped gear as a percentage of your maximum. It only includes items on your person, not those in your inventory. That is, selected shields, armor, weapons, and items. At over 60% equipment load, your character starts to move slower and roll a lot slower. You're less maneuverable and more likely to get hit. And just because it's heavier doesn't mean it's better. Compare the weight of the armor in relation to its ability to defend against physical and magical attacks. Don't forget to level up your stat responsible for load, and also, where possible, look for rings that affect your load. While some Dark Souls players liked characters of stone, I always valued maneuverability, and I think it's always better to be faster than your enemy. Number three. In early parts of the game, it pays to upgrade your armor. This is for two reasons. Firstly, because it increases your physical, magical, and elemental defenses almost to the point of far better armor, but it also adds no weight to your load ratio, unlike stronger replacements. If you're going to get hit, and you will get hit, at least ensure you take as little damage as possible. And number four, look for a 100% damage reduction shield. All shields have percentage reduction for types of damage, and this is either physical or elemental. For example, a 95 physical reduction shield will mean you're still taking 5% damage while blocking attacks. You can't always roll because of the need to conserve stamina, and among multiple enemies you might roll out of one attack into another, so you really need to find a shield to block 100% of damage. Unfortunately, these seem rarer in Dark Souls 2. You can also upgrade your shield, just like your armor, and this also helps in its ability to protect you from damage. Lastly, a little bit about the game world. Number one, explore all areas of the world. Look for invisible walls, hidden paths, and areas that look like they can't be accessed. You may see a soul resting in an area that looks out of reach. Chances are that this soul or item is something of extreme value. If you can, rotate the camera right around to see if you're missing anything above or below you. You never know what you'll find. Number two, lock stones will usually unlock rooms with items in them or activate useful functions in the environment, or even could unlock whole new levels. Buy them whenever you see them in an NPC's shop. Number three, read item descriptions. Not many people do this, but the people that do find it really rewarding. It may have some hidden messages or perhaps a meaning that explains its usefulness, or perhaps some key to the lore of Drain Lake. Number four, Talk to all NPCs. In fact, make a nuisance of yourself by exhausting their possible conversations. You may unlock some information you need to proceed, or you may even be given an item. Ah, yes. I have not thanked you for humoring me the other day. This is for you. Of course, I have no idea what it is. <laughs> also, it's just generally a good idea to buy something from each and every NPC you come across. Some may offer additional information after you do so, or maybe even perform other services for you at other locations. That's everything to bring you up to speed. We left plenty for you to discover on your own. For more information on covenants or crafting, be sure to skip back to that section of the video. Or check out the Dark Souls 2 wiki. 
The Souls games are incredibly deep and we won't know everything about them until a few months or years after release. We hope all that helps, adventurers. Go seek misery. Yeah!